today's show. We go into the meeting with to talk about results and then talk about the following year with the chief marketing officer and CEO. And we do our dog and pony show and you know, the whole thing. And we are just like strutting our stuff. We're so proud of ourselves. And I may have broken my arm, patting myself on the back. It was just like <laughs> fabulous work. Yeah. And I will never, ever forget this as long as I live. The chief marketing officer said, this is fantastic. And from a PR perspective, congratulations. But sales are down. We're losing growers. Like, and, and they just like went through all this stuff from a business perspective that was wrong. And after I got over the sick feeling, it still gives me a pit in my stomach, that sick feeling of, holy cow, really? I started to think there has to be a better way. Five, four, four three, three, two, one. one. Welcome to the Creator Institute Podcast. Your host, Erin Koster. On today's episode, We get an answer to the question of what it's like to be one of the country's top public relations professionals and to try and do PR for your own book. Jeannie Dietrich joins me. She's the CEO of uh, Altman Dietrich and also the the founder and operator of Spin Sucks, the blog. She's also the author of Spin Sucks. And she talks a lot about what it's like to do PR in today's environment, the move from sort of this sort of traditional press world to a digital world. And one of my favorite things she shares with us is how to get her attention. And hint, it's not actually by sending her a cold email in her inbox. You'll be sort of surprised at the answer. This is a fun episode to really dive into this concept of what it's like to be able to get attention in today's media landscape uh, and understand how she's been able to think about it differently for herself, for her own clients, and the idea of being an individual in a world that needs to build individual brands. It's a fun conversation. I think you'll enjoy it a lot. We had some smiles as we talked about the simplest way to get people's attention, and uh, and, and it's a fun conversation. So on today's show, Jeannie Dietrich. I am excited to... Uh, Listen, I you know I talk a lot about transparency, and so I get to talk to someone who who basically gets to preach transparency as part of her uh, her day to day living. So, so Jeannie Dietrich, um, on the podcast today, excited to hang out with someone who got this st- to live a stint in Omaha as well. So, super excited to to get to hang out today. Yeah, it's so funny we have that in common. I know there's something about being that like kind of good Midwesterners that that uh, <laughs> that creates creates good things. So, um. So listen, I think one of the things that that I loved in reading your book, and you write a book, uh, it's sort of this funny thing. You write about open, honest transparency and communications in a world that you sort of describe as has a bit of a, a, a negative perception of the the world of of PR. And and I'd love to give a little quote before letting you you talk about attacking the industry a little bit for for by you say what you write in the book is hollywood has not often been kind to the pr industry uh, wag the dog depicts a spin doctor uh you write about in sex in the city the character samantha mm-hmm. was a publicist mm-hmm. uh you know reality television star lizzie gruberman was a work of celebrity publicist and and you you, you basically lay out the thing that like we've sort of got this reputation of being spin doctors and and then you write a book called spin sucks so <laughs> tell me tell me how you kind of came to this realization that you had to sort of take take issue and take aim at kind of being more open as an industry well when spin sucks the blog launched in 2006 which is crazy to even think about a decade. um yeah it's like i mean it's more than a decade old that's crazy um, through my business, I would get so frustrated because people say to you, when you say that you're a PR professional or you're in communications, you know, at a networking event or on the plane or in an elevator or whatever, one of the first things people say is, oh, you lie for a living. And you're like, no, I don't lie for a living. And that's the whole point is I like, love you too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, thanks. It's nice to meet you as well. Yeah. Awesome. Um, uh, and you know, it's, it's sort of always been this way. And yeah, Hollywood has not depicted it well. Pol- politics has not depicted it well. And I, the book or the blog launched in 2006. The book was published in 2014. And now here we are in 2018 yeah. <clears throat> with the current administration in the White House yeah. with fake news and alternative facts. And, you know, it's this whole world of lies and. Right it's so easy to check facts and yet Mm -hmm. we're still living in this world where people are not transparent or authentic and they Mm -hmm. do lie. And so I think it's even more important than it was when, when we published the book. Yeah. And and as you, you think about it, right. You know, you, you came out with this message that in some ways, you know, you're, you're, you're both a 
part of the industry and a leader in the industry. And here's you taking kind of a subtle, <laughs> subtle aim at it. I mean, yes. did you, were you, were you nervous at all to sort of make that claim to sort of, to basically, you know, point out what was, what you saw as sort of a big risk to the entire industry? I, when we started blogging about it, I was nervous and I definitely rode the fence where, you know, I played Switzerland and sort of showed both sides of the story right. and that didn't work. It didn't work. Mm -hmm. Hmm. And so then I was like, okay, I, you know, I think I got on my soapbox about something and I was just like ranting, which back in the day you could actually rant on your blog and it worked. It <laughs> right. um, doesn't work so much anymore, but, right. um, people really responded to it. And so mm -hmm. by the time the book was published, I sort of had that, the, the confidence to be able to do it. And, you know, what it has afforded me is relationships with industry organizations to be able to change that. And so yeah. now because of the brand that we've built, we're able, we have partnerships with the industry organizations to help change it. And I don't think that would have been the case if we had sort of just remained Switzerland. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, your, your, your blog is, is, you know, in a lot of ways, it is this sort of open, transparent relationship that you have with, I mean, now like almost 60,000 people. <laughs> and so you, 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 you know, you, you share openly like mistakes you've made and things that are issues and like people, uh -huh. mistakes in it. What's the, like, does, did that take you a, a while to get the confidence to just be that, that <laughs> open or was it one of those things you're like, all right, here we go. Oh no, it took, it, it takes a while. And I think you have to see some success before, because we're so accustomed to not wanting to be criticized and, you know, communicators by trade tend to be people pleasers. And so mm -hmm. not wanting to make anybody mad. And I will tell you, I know exactly the blog post that tipped the scales for us. I was at a conference in 20, 2009, maybe. Mm -hmm. And, um, a big name speaker came on stage wearing a backwards ball cap, a torn t-shirt and jeans that looked like he had just pu pulled them up off the floor and put them on. He literally looked like he had rolled out of bed. And I had spent $2,500 to attend that conference. And I was yeah. kind of like, you know, this is not okay. I mean, right. I understand that we're, it's, it was an SEO conference and I understand that, you know, SEO people are, tend to be geeky and, you know, live in their mom's basements or whatever it happens to be. But there's also a sense of professionalism right. that I think needs to occur. Now, since I, I wrote this blog post about, and I think it was called why professional speakers shouldn't wear jeans on stage, something <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Um, I've softened my stance on it a little bit because, you know, you can wear jeans and still look professional. You can wear mm -hmm. nice jeans with a, a blazer, you know, whatever it happens to be. Yeah. So I softened my, my stance a little bit. But I tell you what, people came out of the woodwork. People were like, you're wrong. You're like, this is ridiculous. And, mm. and it, it was funny because they were very respectful in telling me that I was wrong and nobody called me stupid or dumb or an idiot or anything. Right. <clears throat> but to this day, people will say, do you remember that blog post you wrote? And I'm like, really? yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it sounds like, you know, I think what you were what's sort of the difference of being like a troll about it is like, you're not being snarky. You're sort of being, you know, you, you paint an argument from a logical place, which I think, I think is helpful for people to sort of understand is that like, there's something to this being able to be critical from a yes. place of, of, you know, sort of constructive critical criticism as opposed yes. to like being a troll. And I think that's a, a, a line that you have to, to, to walk on the right side of. Well, I think it's really important right now, too, and you know, not to to keep bringing up the White House, but sure. it, there, it's you know, it's this the society culture that we live in right now is everybody wants to argue their point, and right. they aren't. Most people are emotional about it, not logical about it. Yeah, and there is value. I always say, attack the idea, not the person. Mm -hmm. And so, if you can take it from that approach, and it goes back to if you took debate in high school or you were part of the debate club, it goes mm -hmm. back to that. Like you, mm -hmm. you logically attack the idea and the approach versus the human being mm -hmm. because what happens is we tend to attack the human being and that gets us nowhere yep yep i agree the, i think it's i think it's a challenging place we're at right like it's hard to even have discussion yes. with people and i yes you know, yes I, it's hard <laughs> hard i mean growing up in the midwest i i have a lot of friends that i mean i would call myself fairly moderate but like listen i i'm a east coast guy now or like a coast guy now so right. I, I even have a hard time right. even carrying on like a realistic conversation it's tough and it's 
It's unfortunate because I do think that the dialogue is a powerful thing. We just don't do it very well anymore. We are, and I think social media has made it worse yeah. for us because we tend to get behind our computer screens and just type out stuff that we would never actually say to a person if they were standing in front of us. Yeah. And that's, I think, the other challenge with you know creating content and publishing books and things like that. You know, you want to the th- the kinds of things that attract people are the way that you think in your unique approach to ideas and you know no idea is new but it's in the way that you approach things and the way that you um articulate things that makes it interesting to people and mm-hmm. that's unfortunately what sells newspapers it's what sells magazines and it what sell it's what sells books yeah so if you can think about it from the perspective of let's have a stance but do it based on an idea and not yeah. based on a population of people, you're going to be more successful. Right, right. Now, what was the thought process on your end? You, you know, you had this successful blog, you're building this big community. I mean, you know, you, uh, there, there, there's lots of fancy, fancy sort of rankings out there that say this is the most popular or the one of the most prestigious blogs of PR out there. What was the decision to, you know, almost a decade later say like, let's write a book because it's, it seems, you know, was there, was there a, was there a logical process that you went through to say, all right, now is the right time or right place? Or was it like, hell, all right, no better. I got a couple extra hours a week. Let's do this. <laughs> well, I think a couple of things. The first is um, I have an English degree, and mm. you know, I quite honestly, I went into PR because I needed a job. Like, I, <laughs> right, right. I didn't have a PR degree. I didn't know anything about PR. I needed a job, and with an English degree, there's not a lot you can do. Mm. Um, you write good, yeah, <laughs> right. You done well. Yeah. Um, and so when I when I started in the agency business, my dad was like, you know, I'm really surprised you're not doing something with writing, but you know, communications you do, right. You're just, it's not right. It's not a creative outlet, you know, like fiction mm-hmm. for instance. Mm-hmm. And so because of the, the popularity of the blog, I was offered a co-authorship of a book. So marketing in the round. And I thought, well, you know, heck it's a lot easier to write half of a book than it is a full book. Yeah, And it yeah. was with somebody who had already had publishing under his belt. So he kind of knew the ropes and, you know, guided me along. Um, and ba- at, on the heels of the success of that, our publisher came back to us and said, came back to me and said, are you interested in writing another book? And I was like, mm-hmm. yeah, I've actually always wanted to write the book Spin Sucks. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just, you know, timing or whatever. And, and yeah. she, she said, I think now's the time. So that's why I did it. Not because I thought, well, now's the time or I have extra time or anything like that. And right. then it made my dad very proud that finally I was doing <laughs> writing in my career instead yeah. of the PR thing. <laughs> the whole reason you do it is just so that dad would leave right. you alone. Right. <laughs> now you're proud. Come now on. I've got that English degree working. That's right. So, so, so you, you write in the, in the, in, in your book a little bit, you write this, this line that I, I sort of struck me a little bit because you've, You've in some ways taken the PR career from sort of the pre-digital world to the the fully digital world as as we've gone. Mm-hmm. Um, you write the you write this this line that I thought was compelling that the digital web has forever changed the way we communicate. It's changed the way we all do business, and it has forever changed the way we the PR professionals perform our jobs. So what what have you seen now that you as you've in some ways built built a uh, you know part of your brand part of your career on being a digital you know sort of a digital first organization? What do you what do you see has been the biggest difference in terms of the way that you uh you guide people you guide yourself you think about yourself like what have you seen as the bigger changes i'm going to tell you a story and i tell this story a lot but it i think it's a good catalyst for how we got here Mm -hmm. so i worked for a gigantic pr firm in kansas city left omaha moved to kansas city and i worked on the ocean spray account and i loved working on the ocean spray account because not only did they have a gazillion dollars for right. us to spend, right. I mean, a gazillion dollars. Yep. No, no company should pay, should spend as much as they did on PR, but they did. And it was a blast. And I was all of 23 years old, you know, mm-hmm. um, we did. Ha- have you ever seen a cranberry cranberries harvested? I mean, only in the commercial where you see them standing in like a <laughs> bunch of water. With right. That's, that's exactly yeah. what, yeah, that's exactly what it looks like. So they flood the fields and it becomes these lakes of red because all the cranberries come mm. off of the vines and float to the top. And then that's how they harvest it. It's, it's a stunning, it's beautiful. And during harvest time in particularly in Wisconsin, Boston, the Boston area and British Columbia is, is where cranberries are harvested the most. And so you see these lakes of just red. It's stunning. It's absolutely stunning. So one year we created it, the art of the ocean spray harvest and we hired photographers for the three regions 
um, to go out and, and shoot the cranberry harvest. And then we created an art gallery that traveled. Hmm. And part of that was sampling ocean spray juice and all that kind of stuff. And we had, you know, stationary and we, we had a, a charity partner. I mean, it was a full on like coup communications, to, uh, Plant program and everybody and their brothers covered it. Good Morning America. We created a cranberry bar- bog in Times Square, and the Today Show covered it. Like everybody covered it, and we were just like, you know, at this point, I think I was twenty six or twenty seven, and I'm like strutting my stuff, and I'm well on my way to yeah, making partner it. at the agency because right. we just killed it. Right. We go into the meeting with to talk about results, and then talk about the following year with the chief marketing officer and CEO, and we do our dog and pony show and you know, the whole thing. And we are just like strutting our stuff. We're so proud of ourselves. And I may have broken my arm, patting myself on the back. It was just like (laughs) fabulous work. And I will never, ever forget this. As long as I live, the chief marketing officer said, this is fantastic. And from a PR perspective, congratulations, but sales are down. We're losing growers. Like, and, and they just like went through all this stuff from a business perspective that was wrong. And after I got over the sick feeling, it still gives me a pit in my stomach, that sick feeling of, holy cow, really? I started to think there has to be a better way. Like if you're going to spend $2 million on communications, you have to be able to show that it translates a return on investment. You have to. Right, right, right. And that's a long way to say that the digital web now affords us that because Mm -hmm. we have data and we have analytics and we can track exactly what people are doing and where they came from and, you know, how they learned about us. You know, it used to be a lot easier because you had the top of the funnel, the middle of the funnel and the bottom of the funnel. And now they come in from all areas and, you know, a cold lead may come in at the bottom of the funnel instead of the top, which is where you want them. And so, you know, it's, it's harder from that perspective because they're coming from all different spots, but you have the data that can show you exactly where, where your efforts are translating to a real return. Do you see, do you see something, you know, I think the other thing that I would, that I, I, I think is kind of an interesting transition we've seen is it used to be such a heavy emphasis about the brand. And now you see this sort of like translating to more individuals as brands, right? Mm-hmm. You see that yes. happening. How do you, how have you seen that play out? Because I'm guessing for, you know, it, for a long time, it's like, Hey, the brand, the brand, the brand. And now it's like the brand is a lot of people. And sometimes we can help them boost their brand and help, help the company. What do you see that transition uh, happening too? Well, I, I think on the, the brand side, the organization side, people buy from people. And it doesn't yeah. matter if you're a consumer business or a business-to-business business. They're still people, and that's yeah. who you buy from. Mm-hmm. And I think that goes in into what we're talking about with content creation and writing books, too, is people are going to, to buy your book or read your book or read your content or share your content because of you, yeah. not because of the brand. Yeah. Um, so you ha- it, that, you know, even though... We've gone from like one to many to to one to one where we can still communicate on an individualized basis because of the digital web. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really has afforded us a nice way to be able to customize and individualize our messages directly to a person Mm -hmm. versus a group Mm -hmm. of people. Yeah, it's it's, and and I mean, no better case than you, right? I mean, a lot of times is is uh, (laughs) you say on your website, if you don't like something, blame 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 Jenny. She's the she's the cause of this whole thing, right? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it, 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 you know, it's, it's, I think that these, the people are what we're trying to connect with. And, and so let me, let me take right. on that a little bit. Go like, let's run on that one a little bit. What did you see about like you building the brand or brand around you? I mean, you, you, you have a book, you have a blog, your, 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 your face is plastered a lot of places. Um, what have you seen as that, as you, as brand, how, how has that experience been? And particularly you thinking of it both as an individual, but also as like a PR professional, how do you see that like playing out for you as brand? It's, I I would say it's both rewarding and challenging. And the Mm -hmm. reason it's challenging is because people want you. Yep. And as you scale, there's only so much of you. Mm -hmm. Um, So we have learned, uh, well, not learned, we're still learning (laughs) because I have trouble with this, um, that when you make you, when you're the brand and you make you scarce, people are willing to pay more. Interesting. Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. Um, but I have a, I, and I understand that logically, but I have a hard time not showing up the same way for everybody, no matter yeah. if they pay not something or not. Yeah. Um, that's really challenging for me. Mm. Um, the other thing, you know, on the, on the flip side, I have a PR firm and my name is on the door on that. And so right. clients will say, well, I want you. And so right. I've spent 
I've worked really hard in the last five years to build up my team and make them the experts and keep my mouth shut in meetings Mm -hmm. so that clients begin to depend on them instead of me. Mm -hmm. Um, It's also a little bit of a a blow to your ego when clients stop asking for you. (laughs) So it's that whole like, well, wait a sec. A second? <laughs> you you don't want me, really? Yeah. Oh gosh, I thought I thought I was the most important thing here. Right. And I know uh, I've been working toward that, but ow. Now it hurts a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Now it yeah. hurts a little bit. So what what was it like being your own PR uh, agent for your book launch? I, I oh. was I, I mean, I think it's gotta be an interesting thing because you 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 suddenly are good at at advising and then you become the, the patient, right? Like a doctor oh. trying to do that. What if what it was like? It's terrible. Terrible, terrible, terrible. I mean, it's the whole reason the the phrase the shoemaker's children don't have shoes because yeah. I'm phenomenal at helping brands grow. Not mm-hmm. Terrible at doing it for myself. Because <laughs> right. You have to talk about yourself. And I think yeah. as human beings, we're not super good mm-hmm. at that. Mm-hmm. Did you, did you learn anything that you would, you know, obviously every author I've met and you're no, no different now that you've had two books, there's a third at some point down the road. Ugh. Did you learn, learn some things? I know, sad to say it's true though. Know, you know it. I know. Um, there, there's things that you would do different now that you look at today's world and, and, you know, you talk about the digital world. How do you think differently about building a book, a brand those sorts of things in today's media environment? It's funny you say that because I'm in the process of doing a second edition of Spin Socks and it's... Mm. I, I think that most of what we did in 2014 won't work today. Uh, really? Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and um, why is that? Well, things have changed. I mean, as you know, things change pretty rapidly. Yep. Um, there are things that you have, you have to do for book sales, which are yucky and I don't feel good about, but you have to do mm-hmm. them. Um, mm-hmm. You know, if you want to get on the New York times bestseller list, which was one of our goals, make sure that the book doesn't come out the same week as Cheryl Sandberg's lean in. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Turns out, <laughs> turns out that's probably a good idea to, you know, check that kind of stuff. Um, but I think you have, you, the, the basics remain the same because you're still marketing, you're still promoting, you know, brand ambassadors work extraordinarily well. Mm-hmm. So the basics stay the same. It's just in how you use the, the available tools to help you mm-hmm. market and sell. Do you, do you still buy into, there's this sort of, per, there's this perception out there that uh, people don't cover books. They cover some other story related to the book. Is that, did, yeah. that true? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, a good example, I don't know if you read this or not, but Went right before Fire and Fury came out, he uh, Michael Wolf did the the um, talk show segments and everything, and you know did his his speaking tour and all that. And one of the things I thought he did really really well is he took portions of the book and melded them into articles. Hmm. So it was like a lot of people will say, "Here's the first chapter for free; you can right. download that." Or you right. know, he took sections that he thought were the most compelling and smushed them into an article with nice transitions and everything. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, the Atlantic ran something, Vanity Fair ran something, the New Yorker ran something. And in fact, I think it was the New Yorker article that I was like, I've got to read this book. Yeah. Um, but then you, you read it and you're like, oh, he really, he really took the best parts of this book. And it's kind of <laughs> like a movie trailer. They take the best parts yeah. and yeah, he did it really well, mm-hmm. really well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, it, and it's, I think th- th- with shortening attention spans and sort of the yes. media and those things that, that kind of, kind of matters a lot. Do you, do you see, as you think about, you know, again, a 2018 launch versus 2014 launch, do you see the platforms, um, you know, social media platforms and visual and stuff like that? Does that change the way you think about it? Yeah, I think you would want, I mean, I think we'll probably be doing a lot more video, which is not my forte. I don't especially like video. And mm-hmm. I think a lot more audio, you mm-hmm. know, like six, it's something like 67% of human beings are visual learners. So you've, you've got to, to meld that into your book promotion and marketing. Mm-hmm. You have to. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the best books I've seen published in the last year or so do that really well through the book where they'll say for more information on this, go to this link and it's, you know, templates and worksheets and videos that, and you know, that of course doesn't work from a fiction perspective, but it definitely works from a a business slash self-help slash promotion, whatever, you know, nonfiction perspective. It definitely works. So driving people to your website Mm -hmm. where they can get more information, where then you can actually start to convert them into customers or, you know, whatever it is your business goals are Yep, that allows you to start to do that. So I think, you know, the, the books that are doing that 
are, it's really admirable. Mm -hmm. Any, any sort of folks that you would, you look to, to say, these are the people that I, I, uh, you know, admire. I'm like a big, you know, Tim Ferriss fan or a Heath brothers fan, or who, who do you think's doing, who doing it well these days that you look to as you build out the next plan to do this, that you would, you would mimic or copy or learn from? You know, mine are tend to be a little off the, the beaten path. I love Gino Wickman who wrote traction, which is about yeah. business planning yep. um, and rocket fuel, which just came out. I love how he drives people to his website. Mm -hmm. um, Chris Smith, who wrote the conversion code, mm -hmm. phenomenal way, way of looking at how this all interacts off online versus offline. Mm -hmm. um, who else am I big on right now? I would say those are the, probably the two big ones. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think, do you, uh, so, so what will be the, what would be the, the, the one thing that you think you would do again, that you went, that worked well in the first go, go about this one? You say like, all right, this was, this was particularly successful. <clears throat> Brand ambassadors, you know, we have such an engaged community yep. and we've moved our community. We noticed a big decline, which I think everybody has noticed in comments on the blog mm -hmm. and but people were still having conversations. And so we moved the community to Slack. Mm, interesting. And yeah, it's, you know, it was a little slow going at first because we were early adopters of it and people were kind of like, what is this? And, and why are we here? And, you know, so it was, pretty quiet and we had to kind of seed conversation at first, mm -hmm. but I think we have 1500 members now. Wow. And it's yeah, crazy. I mean, it's not too bad. And you know, the conversations in there are different. It's, it's what I'll call dark social. It's different than what you would see, you know, on Facebook or Twitter or even LinkedIn mm -hmm. where that's more public facing. These conversations are things like, you know, I'm having this challenge with a client and I don't really know how to handle it. What do mm -hmm. you say? Or, you know, yeah, there, so the conversations tend to be more in depth and heady yeah. than yeah. they do tend to be on, you know, public facing social. Yeah. There's, that is like an interesting trend that's out there. This sort of uh, ability to get sort of deeper niches with people. I mean, there, yeah. I think it goes back to your, your comment a little bit more about authenticity, transparency, open communications that I think the, in some ways we went uh, to the extreme where everything was open and everything was findable and everything was judgeable to where like, how do you wind up like finding a safer place where, yeah, like it's, it's open, but it's also a little bit walled. It is a little bit walled. You know, I mean, people can certainly still take screen grabs and all that kind of yeah, stuff, of but you know, your, your boss can't log on and see that you've been on Facebook. Right. That's true. Because, That's true. Right. Yeah. It's pretty well walled off from that perspective. Yep. Yep. That's really interesting. And it, it, did you, do you think that that kind of like trend will continue? Like, do you see, you know, sort of, are you pushing more and more people into Slack and seeing that as becoming the place where people are having these, these conversations? Yeah. And you know, one of the things that we really weighed doing that versus Facebook group. And of course, mm -hmm. with the recent Facebook changes, we, we sort of questioned maybe that wasn't the right thing, but what we like about Slack versus face, a private Facebook group is when you log on to Facebook because you're, you need to go to the group to yeah. do something, 20 minutes goes by and you're <laughs> like, why right. was I here? Yeah, exactly. And, and then you close it and then you're like, ah, oh, I never got to the group. Dang it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> ah. So with Slack, it's just a desktop application. So literally if you open it, you're there for one purpose and you yeah. don't go down that rabbit hole. Yep. Yeah, it's it's. I think there's an one of my friends is a is a guy named David Spinks, and he's the the. Oh yeah, I know David. Yeah, yeah, CMX, right? And he talks. Yeah. He's talking a lot about that same thing. Is that we've sort of like everyone's talking about community. Everyone believes it's important, but like we don't really quite have the tools. We don't quite know what it is, and like there is this, you know, like I don't know if Facebook is the place I want to go with my professional stuff. LinkedIn right. hasn't figured it out. Right. So, right. Um, there's this. There's this next wave of all this that for, sort of feels like it's coming. And, and I don't know if anyone has, quite has it nailed yet. Yeah, I don't know either. You know, it's funny you say that because we just had a conversation internally about this where we have we have a lot of really good ideas for the community, but there's no, the technology doesn't enable us to <laughs> right, do it yet. Right, right. So it's kind of like, do I don't really want to spend $100,000 to build it inside our website because... Yeah, I, I do. I agree. I think it's coming, but we may mm -hmm. just have to be patient for six or eight more months. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, it's certainly is a, is a, is a new world that we're, that we're living in for sure. So, so what do you, what's the kind of, you know, obviously you're someone who is playing in this world of, of, you know, media and sort of that stuff. One of the things, you know, that I work a lot with young folks that are in this like early parts of their career, mm -hmm. how do, how do you advise those folks thinking about this concept of transparency and openness, right? There's this sort of, in some ways it was like, everyone was really open and then people are getting, you know, dinged for jobs because they have a picture of them. Sure, holding a sure. <clears throat> 
What, what have you seen? That, where is sort of the world landing at this point in, in your mind, looking at the balance of transparency versus privacy? Well, I think there's a difference between transparency and being stupid. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's a good distinction. It's a little harsh, but, you know, like, don't go out to a nightclub on a Wednesday night and not show up for ne- for work the next morning. Mm-hmm. And oh, by the way, you snapped, you did a Snapchat story while you were at the nightclub at three o'clock in the morning, and then yeah. you don't show up for network the next morning. That's I feel stupid. Like you're judging me. Are you judging me on this one? Or is it- <laughs> oh, no. should I follow you on Snapchat? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah like that actually, actually really happened. And you're like, wait, don't be stupid. Like, yeah. Or call in sick. Like, come on. Mm-hmm. So, you know, while, while there's that line of, you you can't fire somebody because of what they post on their social. I also still know that you went out clubbing last night and you didn't follow the policy that you have to actually call mm-hmm. the next morning if you're not coming to work. You know, so there's there's that, and so I think there's you, you you want to be transparent and you want to be authentic and you want people to know who you are and what you do and all those kinds of things, but don't be stupid about it. Yep, yep. I think it's 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 a. Uh... It's good advice. So I want to ask a little bit of a of a, another piece of advice. You you, <laughs> you you say in your book you talk that uh, you know recent or soon to be college graduates oftentimes don't know that PR is going to be a career for them. They don't even know exactly what it means. And so you say like people go into PR because quote I'm good with people and uh-huh. quote, I love to plan a party. <laughs> to uh-huh. quote I'm a night person and quote my uh-huh. family doesn't mind if I go to events involved with clients. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh-huh. you, know, you, you I'm sure you get people coming to you for advice on, on getting into this career, breaking into it. What are the things that you're seeing today that help people stand out? Because obviously, um, you know, there, there may not be as clear of a, 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 you know, there is a PR major or minor for people, but, but what, how do people stand out in, in getting into this world today? Today, it is all about how you represent yourself online. And that hmm. goes from, from everything, you know, to, from not snapping that you're at the nightclub at three o'clock in the morning and not showing yeah. up at work to commenting on blogs and following, you know, leaders of the organizations where you think you'd like to work on social media and, Mm -hmm. you know, sharing content. And I mean, it's networking, but it's networking online as well as offline. And Mm -hmm. those are the people who really stand out. I mean, I wrote a blog post today that talks about the idea of, of new business development and how every business has to have sales in order to grow and, you know, PR people, tend to not want to do quote unquote sales because yeah. it's, you know, that's sticky it's and yucky. it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Imperial salesman. And so, but you have, you have to have sales to grow a business and a young woman who's graduating in May commented on the blog and, and, and really all she said was, this is such valuable advice for me as I graduate and start thinking about my job and that sales or new business development is going to be part of it. Mm-hmm. And it's no, so now she's stuck out in my brain because she said right. I'm graduating in May and you know, like if she, she's networking, she's not work. Mm-hmm. And she reached me because she commented mm-hmm. on my blog post. Mm-hmm. It's, it's like, and what people don't realize is that's not, that's simple, right? It's basically it's so her, simple. Being, her being transparent and honest, but it's, it's just different, right? Like whoever this woman is suddenly now uh, you paid attention and right. I'm sure you might get a bunch of cold resumes, but it, you know, this suddenly is something that's like authentic. It's actually means that she read it. Yep. <laughs> so like yep. you feel a little sense. There's this weird sense. People don't realize this, that when someone comments on my blog and they, it's much easier for me that I feel like I feel I have to respond because it's public as opposed to I get an email that I'm like, ah, whatever. Like right. I, I, I get a ton right. of emails. There's this weird psychology with it. So comment on blogs and you'll get up. I promise I can't not respond to you almost. I'm the same way. Totally the same way. And you're right. I mean, I opened my inbox a couple of hours ago and I was like, oh, yeah. But yeah, you comment on the blog and you will get a response. Yeah. It's, it's a, I, I do this exercise with folks that they, they find, um, my students sometimes hate it, but I think it's really powerful as I tell them, listen, you know, you're going to reach out to people to interview for your book. And these are sometimes busy people rather than trying to send them a cold email. I want you to comment on something and mm-hmm. send them a video link to what you're, to your ask. Mm-hmm. And that will suddenly make you stand out. And yep. you know, they, they like, why do I want to do this? I'm going to look like an idiot, but I'm like, no, listen, no. all you're doing is like a totally different conversation. Yes. It's about relationships. You're building a relationship yep. and that, the web allows you to do that really well. Yep. Yep. That's, that's awesome. So I want to, I want to, this has been super interesting and I think it's, I'll be interested to hear, uh, you know, probably have a follow-up conversation as you go out and start to think about marketing your book a second time around, because I think it's interesting sort of what's going on is there's a, just, 
there is a sense that like it, a book is just a part of a platform, broadly speaking. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. I'll be interested to hear as you think about it. But it's been super helpful for me just to sort of process some of these these things you're thinking about um, as you go about it. Well, this was super fun. And, uh, you know, Spin Sucks, the, the blog, I, I found myself last night, I was flipping through it. There is a ton of stuff on there. And, and I, I literally like flagged a bunch of articles that I was like, oh, gosh, this is going to be helpful. So a ton of stuff in there. The book's great. And Thank um, you. super excited to, to hang out with a fellow Creighton person. I, I know, it's so fun. <laughs> one Creighton class, I can say, but it was one of my best college classes. I feel like you and I then have a bond because of our Creighton bond. There we go. I agree. <laughs> Thanks, Jenny. I appreciate it. Bye.